Amazing minute. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today, we have one of our very favorite guests who often graces us with his presence once a month and sometimes even more, none other than our resident psychologist, Dr. Doug Lyle. Now, whenever we have a doctor on the show, but Dr. Lyle in particular, we get so many questions. So to get priority, please consider signing up for my newsletter at chefaj.com. We only email you about once a week to tell you who's on the show, and then you just respond with your questions. And boy, have we got a lot of them. How are you doing, Dr. Lyle? Just great, AJ, and I want to say you look fabulous. <laughs> well, thank you. I figure as right. you're an evolutionary psychologist, and so I wanted to wear something that they might have worn in the Stone Age. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So uh, you never shy away from controversy. So why don't we just get the controversial one out of the way right oh, away? How's that? That's all good. Because there's actually two questions about raw food. And let me just preface it with saying that I try to be, I like to be respectful to all my guests and I like different opinions because my feeling is, is even if somebody's right, if you can't do it, maybe somebody else has a, another system that might work for you. Right. So last week we had raw food week on Chef AJ Live where we had doctors and people that have been following what's called an 80-10-10 raw food diet, a very healthy version of sugar, oil, salt, processed food. These are people that are athletes and they are thriving on it for 30 years and more. And so many people were interested. For example, Mandy, who said, what does Dr. Lyle think of maybe doing a 10 day raw vegan challenge? But then Karen Rice, he said, could you please ask Dr. Lyle, uh, I would like a reconciliation of the schools of thought put out by Dr. Doug Graham and Dr. John McDougall. I would be curious to hear Dr. Lyle's response because Dr. Doug Graham, who also follows the low fat diet, just like Dr. McDougall feels we're natural fruit eaters and should eat just fruits and vegetables with a little bit of fat. And of course, Dr. McDougall is based on starch and it's not even so much who's right, but what does the science say, at least maybe from this evolutionary perspective that you're so familiar with? Um, yes, yeah, so here's the, so now we've had everybody weigh in and now we're gonna get the truth, of course. <laughs> the, um, all right. So <clears throat> there's, uh, there's a lot of different ways to try to arrive at the truth. I actually heard a little bit of uh, these two people's uh, statements. I didn't listen to uh, uh, Doug Graham's statement in its entirety. I just heard part of it. But I heard what Mark, Dr. McDougall says, and it sounds like uh, uh, my friend Jen Hawk calls it a stump speech. You know what I mean? That's what politicians, they get their speech, and then they go around on the train and say the same thing over and over again. And it's not too long before you're hearing John Stump's speech. And uh, it's solid as a rock. Uh, there's, there's a few things that I would, uh, that I would disagree with. But in, in substance, I, I'm, I'm with everything he says. And I think that some of the, whoever was interviewing them, some of the questions uh, that were being put to, is, is Doug Graham a doctor? Should I call him Dr. Uh, he's a He's a chiropractor. Okay. Like Dr. Goldhammer. Right. So uh, the, 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 I, think, I think he misinterpreted some of this is what happens when, um, when, when things aren't being said in real time and you're not getting exactly what the person is saying. So John had said, hey, you know, the people stored these, uh, the foods in a way that you can't store fruit and they were, you know, freeze dried in the ground or whatever. And Doug Graham said they couldn't have been freeze dried food because they didn't have vacuum packers sent thousand years ago. That's not what John meant. John just meant that you could store, you can freeze a potato. It can be naturally stored in the ground all winter so that there was a, there was foods for uh, humans in the winter time. And they, those would have been starches. And then, uh, and, and John goes on to say, you can't eat, uh, fruit is very seasonal. So our, our ancestors couldn't have been uh, surviving on fruits because they didn't have fruits all through the year. And then drug Graham says, well, now, wait a minute, that's ridiculous. You can have fruit shipped from anywhere. John wasn't answering that question. John was using a theoretical question looking down through evolution. And Doug is answering a question that has nothing to do with that. Okay. So that's a, that's a misunderstanding is what each other was talking about. And so that, so now we're going to triangulate on essentially <clears throat> two different questions because there's two, there's two entirely different questions here in the winter uh, would be the, the, the evolution of the human diet, what the human diet sort of looked like over time and what did 
our ancestors eat uh, in their revolutionary history? That's one question. And the second question, uh, which we think is related, uh, and it is related, but it is not exactly the same question, which is what's the healthiest diet for us to eat? Those are actually two very separate questions, folks. And very often uh, we get debates and confusion as people sort of tumble those two things together and then they get very defensive about the evolutionary history because as if the evolutionary history is the checkmate argument about what it is that we should be doing today, okay? And our evolutionary history, a lot of times people didn't wear shoes and there are people today that say you shouldn't be wearing shoes and maybe they've got a point. But I have to tell you where I walk, I need to be wearing shoes, okay? So if I'm walking across a parking lot with little shreds of glass in it, uh, I wasn't evolved by nature to be able to handle that. So I'm better off with shoes on. So just because something and shoes aren't natural. So just because we understand what our ancestors did, uh, they, also, they also did tribal warfare with spears and all kinds of coming of age weird stuff that killed some people. So the bottom line is, should we be doing that thing too? Okay, so no. So what we wanna do is we wanna answer two very separate questions. An interesting question is what did our ancestors eat? And the second question is what should we be eating? And how are those two things interrelated? Well, first of all, John is gonna say, well, we were a star cheater, okay? Doug Graham is saying, no, we're a fruit eater. Well, actually um, both are true and both are wrong. So the truth of the matter is this. Truth of the matter is there's no question that human beings were our omnivores that ate very significant amounts of animal food across human natural history. There is no doubt about that. You can jump up and down and you can point to digestive systems and teeth and you can make all kinds of arguments, but the problem is you cannot deny the following truth. That in 175 hunter-gatherer uh, societies that have been looked at for the last 50 years by cultural anthropologists doing field research, every single one of them is omnivorous, okay? It doesn't matter whether we're talking about East Africa, where uh, near the Aldobi Gorges, where it is that human beings, this species probably originally uh, was spawned uh, in, in its something like its current genetic form, probably three or 400,000 years ago. Uh, obviously evolving out of uh, earlier versions all the way back through Australopithecus, all the way back to the common ancestor with the chimpanzee, all the way back to the simian monkeys. It's like, for God's sakes, how far back do you want to take it? What a monkey eats and what you eat has nothing to do with each other. What a chimpanzee eats and what you eat has nothing to do with each other, okay? In fact, what Australopithecus two and a half million years ago ate and what you eat has nothing to do with each other. So the, uh, uh, Doug Graham was making some little comment about evolution, but clear that, Lee, that uh, these, these folks are not clear about their understanding that there has been very, very significant evolution in the human lineage in the last million years. So we are, uh, we are all off a long ways from, the, from a chimpanzee or a gorilla, which are our closest living relatives, but you have to understand closest living relatives, you go back a long ways. I don't know if you've ever been to the zoo, but when I went to the zoo and I saw the female chimpanzees, I didn't get sexually interested. I'm sorry. I just did. We're a long ways, people. <laughs> you know, you're also heavily related to an earthworm, for God's sake. So they say, where, where do you want to put it? Now, your house cat is, looks something like an ocelot. Okay, in other words, but an ocelot, don't try to bring one home and, and turn it into a nice friendly little house cat. You're in for a really tough go. So the same thing with an Arctic wolf. An Arctic wolf is an awful lot looking like a German shepherd, but it's not the same thing. It is a great deal wilder and much more trouble. So you are not a chimpanzee. You're not even remotely close to a chimpanzee. And just because chimpanzees would like to eat a lot of fruit and eat raw food diets, you are not the same thing. And that's one thing that John was trying to say, i.e., he's trying to say, we're the greatest thing. <laughs> like, I know what he means. So do you. You see anything else out there that's walking and talking and, 
and go into the moon? Of course not. I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, all animals to me are in, in, in one sense equal. In other words, we're all products of uh, evolution and we all have complex design and, and we have, a lot of us have feelings and warmth and families and romance. And there was, there's a lot of commonalities, but if you had to pick who's the big kahuna, it's us. All right. That's not joke about that. Who else builds skyscrapers and bullet trains? Now, it's going to turn out that that very same extraordinary mind did something. And what they did was uh, it, certainly in the last 500,000 years as humans, but likely before when they were proto humans, uh, going back maybe another million years, maybe more, uh, they used fire. So fire was an extraordinarily important change. And clearly, as you look around the world, uh, animals are generally terrified of fire. My house cats aren't, which is really interesting to me, by the way. You know, most animals, if they smell fire, they instinctively know that they're in real trouble and they try to run away from it. My cats are happy sitting in front of the fire. <laughs> That's like, hey, you morons, what do you trust me? That you're not gonna get burned? But the truth of the matter is, they're domesticated. So if you think about that, when were they domesticated? In the last 10,000 10, years where they did what? They snuggled up to people around fireplaces. So if you were a little kitty cat, a feral kitty cat, 7,000 years ago somewhere in Babylon, uh, if you happened to be, have the genes to be spooked by fire, then you didn't stay around the humans. But if it turns out that you were a little genetic freak and you didn't, didn't happen to be that worried about fire, you're like somebody today that's not afraid of heights, okay? Almost all human beings today, if you put them up in a tall building and they look out over a balcony, they're freaking freaked. You know what that feeling is. That's from your ancestors that at some point realized, you know what, we have to be extremely careful in these trees because if we fall, we're gonna die. Now we have more worry about that than a modern chimpanzee because a modern chimpanzee still lives in the trees and those things can absolutely fall 40 feet and do. And it has been observed by Jane Goodall scientists uh, that, that if you can, you can, they drop 40 feet, sat there winded, you know, and then, and then, and then get up and walk off. Wow. A human drops 40 feet and lands on its back and it's almost certainly dead. Okay. So therefore, in order to make sure that you didn't die through the process of us becoming a terrestrial animal, you had something that we're going to call a fear of heights that you still have. Okay. So I forget where I was going, AJ, and where I'm coming from, but the, the, the story is this. We are different than we were 2 million years ago and a million years ago. And so it is going to turn out that one of the most extraordinary changes that took place in human life was our love of fire. We are not just okay with fire. We love it. We love the look of it. It's freaking romantic to look at fire, okay? So you're looking at this extraordinarily dangerous thing and it turns out you're attracted to it. You like the colors of it. You like the feel of it. You like the sound of it. You like the smell of it. And then most importantly, you like the taste of it. So it turns out our ancestors were obviously the first animals on earth that started to systematically cook their food. And it turns out that they instantly liked it. And we know that they instantly liked it because experiments have shown that animals instantly like it if you cook their food, okay? <clears throat> Why would this be? It would be because the cooking of animal uh, flesh will actually denature the protein, in other words, it partially digests it and makes it therefore easier for you to digest, more efficient for you to digest. It's actually softer for you to eat and it also kills parasites. So there are tremendous advantages to cooking meat. There are also tremendous advantages to cooking John McDougall's you know, lovely starches, okay? So it's gonna turn out that you're not gonna be able to make uh, very much use out of a raw potato or God forbid, try to eat raw rice or try to eat raw beans. It's like you're gonna crack your teeth and you're not gonna get any calories out of it. But if you cook it in water, you, uh, you gelatinize the starches and you know what that process looks like when you put oatmeal and then you put water in and then you cook it, it expands, doesn't it? So suddenly it becomes big. You put pasta in water, it expands. You put beans in water and cook them, they get bigger. 
That's that process of breaking down the starch molecules so that you can taste it, you can chew it, you can access the calories. You can tell that you can access the calories because you can taste it and it tastes good. That's your signaling device that there's calories in there that you can use. Notice that you're not crazy about the taste of romaine lettuce because you can find out that there's hardly any calories in it. Notice you love the taste of a Snickers bar. Why? It has 30 times as many calories per pound as the lettuce, that's why. And so what your, your, your taste preference mechanisms can pick up the fact that you have gelatinized the starch and that you can get access to the calories. So it turns out that cooking became a massively important part of the human, human evolutionary story. Now, obviously, cooking could have been damaging to human physiology when it comes to the cooking of the food and caused people to develop chronic degenerative diseases that they never saw in the Stone Age because they're all dead by 40 anyway. They're dead by 40, not of diseases, folks. They're dead by 40 of accidents, tribal warfare, you know, being gored by, by, by an animal. In other words, people just didn't live that long. You're, you're, you are, if you made it to 40 in a Stone Age environment, you were pretty smart and you were somewhat lucky. There's a good chance. Women are going to be dying in childbirth uh, fairly often. Little kids are going to have accidents or get eaten by predators. You know, when it, can you imagine babies crying? Like, what on earth are they doing? And the answer is, they are, it's better off, the cost-benefit evolutionary is better off squawking to your parents if you're lonely and you're not interacting with them, even if it uh, attracts a predator. Uh, because, because if you don't, if you're quiet, and a predator sniffs and, and finds out where you are, they come and eat you, and you didn't get any help. So go ahead and yell like hell, even though you're attracting predators, because you're attracting your mom and your dad, and that wound up being an evolutionary benefit. Thank God it stops by the time they're like three. <laughs> okay? But notice, incidentally, AJ, that children that are four, five, six, seven, eight, nine on a playground are extremely noisy. This is very likely because they were designed evolutionarily to be close to their mothers who are watching them because they are actually still, they need mom's protection because mom's bigger and stronger. And therefore they need to constantly getting mom's attention. That's why they shriek on the playgrounds. It would cause a mom that was watching them nearby to stop her conversation with her friend and look over at junior. And, the, and then the kid laughs after that. And then you realize no predator. So this is a constant, it's like a, a smoke alarm that keeps going off and keeping you on edge. Notice that when kids get to be 13 or 14, they don't do that, okay? The junior high school and the noise on a playground doesn't look anything like a, kinder, a, a, a fourth grader. That's because of the evolved differences and the changes of the problem. Human beings have changed dramatically over the, the millennia. And all, we are now very different than we were a million years ago. And one of the huge differences is that the brain has gotten much bigger uh, over the last million years. And the stomach cavity and the digestive system and the genes that uh, have been selected for starches, for amylase, this is very clear that John is right, that the starch molecule has been an enormously important feature in human evolution for a million years. Now, the, uh, so we have gone away from being a raw food eater that our ancestors uh, three million years ago, we're all raw food eaters. Anybody that says, well, we came from raw food eating animals. Very true, of course you did. All the animals on the planet are raw food animals. We are very much like chimpanzees. We share 99% of their DNA. That's true. You share 99% of your DNA. You also share 70% of your DNA with a yeast molecule. So don't give me numbers that you don't understand, okay? You are, that 1% is massively different. And by the way, it's much more complicated than anybody ever understood. A whole bunch of DNA that we did not understand. We thought it was junk DNA. Turns out it's not junk DNA. So everything everybody thought they understood about human genetics turns out to be vastly more complicated and not what they thought it was. So don't even think about the idea that you share 99% of your DNA with a chimpanzee because that is a meaningless statistic. Okay, now, so the, uh, and completely misleading. You know, so, you know, some, some poor fool that can't add two and two and is drooling in a, in a hospital somewhere of severe retardation, that guy shares 99.9% .9 of his DNA with Stephen Hawking. 
Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now, the um, so now, what it is that 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 we want to think about? What, uh, our ancestors clearly ate a great deal of starches on average. In different areas of the world, their diets were different. If you're over in, in East Africa, you're different than if you're in Northern Africa. If you're in Northern Africa, you're different than you are in the Middle East. If you're in the Middle East, you're different than you are in Northern Europe. And if you're in Northern Europe, you're different than you are in China. And in the last 100,000 100, years ago, all human beings, to the best of our knowledge, were in Africa. In other words, this is where this species came from. Maybe it was 125,000. Estimates go back and forth. The geniuses are trying to figure it out. Maybe it was 170,000 years ago, but at some point, human beings started migrating out of Africa and some of them that migrated out did not die. And so then they seeded populations and as they moved around the earth, they start looking different because the different ecologies call for different physical morphologies. So as you go north, you need more vitamin D from the sun. And so as a result, you need to, uh, protect yourself less from the sun and let more of that solar energy in. And so your skin lightens up. Okay. So when you look at Northern Asians and Caucasians, their skin is lighter for one purpose. That purpose is to, to actually make sure you don't die of diseases like rickets as a result of a vitamin D deficiency. You don't need, uh, uh, so, so therefore, you know, I know many of us, with lighter skin are like, boy, the people with the darker skin have it better because they don't show their aging as much because they're better defended against the sun, okay? That's true. Uh, so th th uh, that's because they were evolutionarily, those genes, when you see darker skinned people from around the equatorial regions of the world, uh, they don't all have the same hair. They don't all have the same facial configurations. They don't have the same body morphologies, but they have darker skin. Why? Because they're getting more sun and they need to defend it they defend the uh, system against uh, uh, that excess and the problems of the sun possible damage. So we start to see differences in that. We start to see other differences in morphology. Some people get taller, some people are shorter. In the Amazon basin, for example, interestingly enough, the, it looks like the ideal size for an average man in the Amazon basin is about five, seven and 140 pounds. Uh, uh, in other areas where they're not in the jungle, uh, men evolved to get bigger, for example, in some areas that is useful for sexual dominance or for other uh, war tribal warfare problems or whatever. What I'm getting at is that you see quite a splintering of individual differences all around the world, and you see groups of people looking very similar, et cetera. And guess what? The different ecologies have different diets. Anybody that thinks that, quote, human beings evolved on fruit and it's a fruit eating animal is not answering exactly what John is saying. What the hell do you think they were doing in Norway 10,000 years ago? They couldn't possibly have been a fruit eating animal. They have been in Norway for at least 50,000 years, maybe 80, maybe 100. So how on earth did they do that? They couldn't have possibly been a fruit, raw fruit eating creature because there's no fruit in Norway. And the fruit that's there is only gonna be there for about six weeks. So what did they eat? They did not live their lifespans out on a raw fruit diet. They didn't do it. And not only that, no human beings have been shown to be raw eating animals, none of them. In every single tribe, oh, let me point out also, AJ, my commentaries about the tribes and why I'm very interested in them and why they're very important if we're going to try to understand human evolution. You have to understand something fascinating. When you meet somebody that is very different from you in terms of the continent that they evolved on, so you meet an African person right down at the grocery store, or you meet an Asian person down at the grocery store, those genes... You, you, those genes haven't met your genes for 80,000 years. If you have, you have some friend on the internet from Northern China and they're gonna come here for a visit and you meet them and they speak English, okay? And they're a purebred Northern, Northern uh, Asian person. And you meet them and you sit down uh, and you go to lunch with them and you're chit-chatting about John McDougall and Dean Ornish because it turns out that the the young lady is a doctor and she's, she's really interested in this, right? You have everything in common. You're all humans, but 
that person and your genes, you don't have a common ancestor for the last 80,000 years. And so when you're looking at them, you're looking at, okay, how must this have evolved? We know that they couldn't have evolved on a fruit diet because they've been in Northern China. So that's impossible. I know I couldn't have evolved on a fruit diet because I look at myself and I see big nosed Englishmen staring at me from the mirror. It's obvious. My mother's maiden name was Fairchild. That is as, that is as English as it gets. <laughs> okay. My dad had a little bit of redhead in him and his uncle's names were Roten and they claimed they were Dutch in World War II, which was a lie. They were Germans. <laughs> okay. So I got some, a little hint of redheaded, uh, redheaded German uh, redhead that's, that, that's still out of me as my hair turns gray. It's still there. Okay. Now, so what is this? I'm a European. That's what I am. Uh, Europeans, there's no possible way that Europeans in the last 80,000 years were living on fruit diets. That's impossible. Okay. For exactly the reasons that John is saying. So I hope that uh, Dr. Graham isn't thinking that that is the evolution of human history, because that would be impossible. He may be saying, of course, you can eat fruit if you want all day long. It doesn't matter where you are, because we can manufacture and ship it. I hope that everybody understands that that has nothing to do with human evolution. So now, who could have eaten all fruit diets? Could have been the people in equatorial regions that had fruit all over the place. Did they? Well, guess what? We get to go see them because they're still there. And we can get go back and look at hunter-gatherer tribes from all over the world, and we can see actually what they eat, and they haven't changed what they've been doing for 80, 100,000, 200,000 years. Okay. So we know, for example, uh, in looking at the aboriginals in Australia, we can see that they have hand axes that they were until, until the Westerners found them and then started talking to them and then give them Snickers bars to learn about their art. We know exactly how they lived. They're living with the same technology that hasn't changed in 100,000 years. So when we look at their diets, guess what we're looking at? They're doing what their daddy did and they did what their daddy did and they did what their daddy did. They're not doing anything new and different. So what are they doing? Okay, they're digging in the ground for tubers. They are harvesting some wild grains. If a nut tree is anywhere near them and they get it once a year, they get a few nuts. They actually, in very many places, they go after honey. Interestingly enough, it's a, it's a very it's a fascinating and important prize when they get a hold of it. They like that a lot. Uh, they aren't going to get to that honey very well without fire because you're going to need to smoke those bees if you're going to steal their, their stuff. They hunt. So hunting is a major enterprise and it's a major sociological you know, force in human affairs that the men that are the best hunters are prized and they get fancier mates and more mates and they father more children. If you are a very successful hunter, it's very possible that you will have about 25 children. If you are not a very successful hunter, it's very likely that you may have four or five. Okay, so the women care about who the heck the hunter is. So anybody that says that you're just a starchy eater and that people tolerated meat, et cetera, this is not consistent with the anthropological evidence at all. We can go right back into Africa and know that we are basically in a time capsule going back 100,000 years. And we see that meat is prized and that people work extremely hard to get it, okay? And we can see that they're not eating the same meat and the same animals and the same vegetables are, as they are in Norway. If you're in Norway, what do you think the Norwegians have been eating for 80,000 years? Fish, okay? Of course they are, okay? They live in the North Sea, it was full of fish. They would be an, an insane not to. So to, when you start saying, well, what was the human natural diet? Well, what human, where, when, what are you talking about? They're gonna be, so what we would have to say is, well, what's the commonality? Well, the commonality is that they're opportunistic omnivores and they ate whatever it is that didn't kill them. And it turns out that when we look at humans, not surprisingly, that human beings have the widest palate of any land animal and actually probably any animal on earth. So the, what do we mean by the widest palate? They have the most different things that they can eat. Interestingly enough, 
that is a small subset of organic matter. Of all of the plants and animals out there, of all the plants out there, there's very few that you can eat, but it's the widest range of any animal. Why? Because we evolved by crossing all kinds of rivers, lakes, domains, etc. We spread out over the planet and we're the widest ranging land animal on the planet. It's no surprise that we meet that with the widest range and capability of eating the most diverse foods. Fascinatingly, if you were to eat a chimpanzee's diet, you would die because they can actually eat foods that would be poisonous to us, okay? Just as I think people found out, I don't know if this is true or not, I'm sure you probably know, AJ. I don't think dogs can eat like salmon or something. Um, um, I know they can't eat raisins for sure. Uh, um, and they can't eat onion, that I know for sure. Uh, okay, so the, um, so the, the point of this is that that there's, in other words, certain animals can't eat certain things. When, when you look at what humans can eat, it's very vast. It is absolutely omnivorous, okay? So we are not an evolved vegetarian, we're not an evolved vegan, we're, we're not an evolved fruit eater, none of that's true. We are an opportunistic omnivore and you're going to find that the diet uh, yeah, was gonna be made up of the following components in human evolution. Whatever animal food they can get, there, it's very likely that they're going to have survived because they have some major starch resource. Uh, otherwise, if they didn't have it, they wouldn't even bother going into that environment. It would be too dangerous. So they would have needed a starch source that they can aim at. And they, they didn't like pack their bag and then go 20 miles. That's not what human beings did. You grew up where your parents grew up and then you might have moved a mile away maybe two miles away. So you're in the same total habitat. And then a generation later, your kid moves two miles away. And then the next generation moves two miles away. And 10,000 years from now, they've moved several thousand miles. They've moved across the continent, but they didn't do it at once. They didn't pack their bags in Africa and head for Beijing. That's not what they did. They just headed down the road to get away from their parents so that they could have sex and have parties where their parents didn't know what was going on. And then pretty soon they had kids and then they started all over again. That's human evolution. That's how it worked. So, uh, so it turns out that this is these are incremental little little movements that take place generation by generation. Uh, you know, a mile at a time. Now, as they did that, they they wouldn't have gone into the habitat. You know, you got 360 degrees to go when you leave mom's house. You go due north, two degrees off due north, due south to the east to the west. Where do you go? Well, you're going to likely go where the food is. So one of the things you might do is you might follow the um, coastlines. And so it appears that human beings, one group of people coming out of Africa, uh, a lot of people coming out of Africa consistently followed the coastlines down along the coast of India. So it appears that, that being near the ocean has been one major way that people have gone about their business. Other people would have looked at that and said, there's competitive pressure there. I wanna go somewhere away from those tribal SOBs that are coming after my girlfriend. And so as a result, they went somewhere else and they went inland. So human beings went all over the place, wherever it is that was best for them. But if they were following the maritime line, they would have eaten a lot of fish. That would have been important. They, uh, and they would have had sea vegetables and therefore you know, if, uh, there would have been large iodine there. And then if you go somewhere else and there's no iodine, maybe you wind up with a goiter, et cetera, okay? So now, the, but, but as you're gonna move inland, you better have a starch resource because there isn't anything like wild, you know, tons of wild fish along the coastline. There's nothing that rich. There isn't a bunch of gazelles just sitting there waiting to be slaughtered. So it's gonna turn out that of course you're gonna be doing some hunting but you better have a starch resource. There better be some fields of wheat. There better be fields of rice. There better be potatoes in the ground all out over Africa. Tubers have been, have been found in the ground that were a major resource for human beings over the last million years. So what did humans do? Clearly you can tell by the, how many genes they have to code for amylase, which is what an enzyme you need to digest starch. Clearly they have been very focused on starches. That's been an extremely important thing for human beings to be focused on. So absolutely, as John has said, the backbone of every civilization has been starches. It doesn't matter where you go on the globe, you're gonna find them, okay? 
Nowhere will you find anybody that's main caloric resource is raw fruits and vegetables. That is not going to happen. Chimpanzees can do that. That's because they can't make fire and they don't have the big brain that needs a tremendous amount of calories. And so it's gonna turn out that the average chimpanzee, which would be my size, is only burning a thousand calories a day. And they get that from chewing for six hours a day on low calorie density fruits and, and vegetables. That's fine, it's all 100 calories, 200 calories. That's what they're doing. And they just chew through a tremendous amount of it. They digest uh, much larger amounts of food than I do, et cetera. We can see that our stomach has shrunk over the last million years. We can see that our dentition has changed. We can see that we don't have to chew the very harsh food that they eat on a raw food diet. And it's gonna turn out that the entire body has this uh, digestive system has morphed around a higher calorie density fare uh, up, up to you know five, six, 700 calories a pound. And it's gonna turn out that's gonna be extremely useful because you're gonna need it because you're going to be burning a tremendous amount of calories as a human being, not because you're working very hard physically, but because you've got a huge brain. So a human being is gonna be burning vastly more calories than a chimpanzee because of their enormous brain, okay? So our ancestors invented a new muscle. It's called your brain, okay? And that brain needed big time calories and it got it from starches and it got it from meat. Uh, and it certainly decorated it with the old food from its previous uh, lineages, which is raw fruits and vegetables. True, okay? So now, I think I've answered the question as to what the evolution of the human diet was. It would look different in the last 100,000 years, depending upon which continent we're on, but it had already evolved in Africa into its pretty much its current state uh, 100,000 years ago. It evolved as an opportunistic hunter-gatherer that cooked foods, including starches and animal food, dominated the caloric intake of the diet. It was then decorated by, by the raw fruits and vegetables that people could also have access to. That's what it is, okay? How do I know this? I don't have to speculate. All I have to do is go look. All I have to do is go look at modern hunter-gatherers and that is exactly what it is that I'm going to find, okay? Now, now that takes us up to the present. And the present is, well, what does this have to do with me? And the answer is, well, your chassis was, was built out, you know, your skin tone may be light, but your chassis, your digestive system, your, your brains, everything about you was already built out in Africa 150,000 years ago, okay? So that's that. And so you and an African in an East African village that's genes have not left that continent, the two of you would sit down and if they could speak English or you could speak what they're speaking, Everything about their life would make perfect sense to you, you know, and, and what they eat would even make sense to you. It would all look completely reasonable because that is you. That's just you a whole bunch of generations later because uh, your guys uh, got kicked out of the, or, they, or they're wild enough to decide to leave town and, uh, and slowly move out uh, across some different expanse on earth. So that's what it is. So now we say, okay, well, what's the best diet to eat? Well, actually, there's only one way to determine the best diet to eat. So we can look back through all of this uh, triangulation of knowledge in human evolution and understand quite a lot that different, different lineages of people would probably have slightly different diets that might be ideal for them, but it's going to be pretty similar. We can tell this because... If we have somebody with some kind of a problem, if we put them on a McDougal diet, they're gonna get well, okay? If, if it's a dietary related thing, if it's something else, if it's malaria, that's a whole different thing. But the point is, is that uh, we don't have a group of people that if they eat a vegan diet, they wind up developing heart disease and strokes. That it doesn't happen. So the basic chassis is there. We can see how it evolved and what it evolved from. We can be honest and open about all of the evidence and we can actually see what it must have taken in order. We can see actually that Northern Europeans and Northern Asians would have been in a situation where they couldn't have had as much of their diet from raw food and raw fruits, fruits and vegetables. They couldn't have because it wasn't available. 
and it has not been available for a long, 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 long time. And it turns out that human beings could evolve in those situations just fine, okay? Um, now, where does that leave us today? That leaves us with the only possible way that we can determine the healthiest diet. We cannot do it theoretically. Theoretically is what everybody's trying to do. They're trying to pull the trump card out and say, well, I know more about human evolution than you do. And the trump card says, kaboom, this is what they ate. I already know you're wrong because you can't possibly know what people were eating in Madagascar versus what people were eating in Norway versus what people were eating in Shanghai versus what people were eating in, in Australia 50,000 years ago. You can't possibly know that. So there have been mutations since then that could have been important. So you have no idea. So you cannot solve this problem theoretically. Our ancestors ate the diet in their, in their habitat that statistically maximized their personal likelihood of maximizing genetic reproduction. What was that diet? It was the widest possible diet of the richest food that they could possibly get their hands on to make absolutely sure that they did not die of starvation. That is what the diet was in whatever circumstances that was. That diet changed from 18,000 years ago on the Rhine River to 8,000 years ago on the Rhine River in the very same location because of climactic and, and natural history changes so they ate more raspberries, less lat rubbers, more hogs, less sheep. Who knows what they ate? We don't know. We know they're an opportunistic omnivore. Now, now where do we go with this? There is only one possible way to determine the optimal diet. And you can't even do it for humanity because humanity has individual genetic differences. So what you can do is you can guess. And the only way to do it is to do it scientifically. So science does not, uh, is not wedded to theory. In principle, it could be that the most healthy diet might be peanuts exclusively, okay? How would you know? There'd be no possible way for you to know that the healthiest diet wouldn't be just to eat peanuts and they might be cooked, okay? Maybe it's peanuts and mint off your mint bush. Maybe that's the healthiest diet, okay? What we can do is we can use the science of nutrition and we can actually study by using millions of observations. We can use epidemiological analysis and we can attempt to determine are there patterns of dietary behavior that wind up causing people to be susceptible diseases and therefore reduce the length of their life and their well-being? Yes, we can do that. So we can talk to somebody, for example, if we don't want to go do it ourselves, because after all, we don't have a million lifetimes to figure this out, we might actually uh, get benefit from experts. So we might talk to experts that have actually been involved in that research or are experts in reading that research uh, that are, have great scientific training that it can actually understand how to analyze and look at other people's observations and to look for patterns that indicate the truth so that when one observation minds up, maybe somebody was sloppy or somebody was paid off by some food company or drug company, or they had some other ax to grind politically or something else. So instead we wanna look at a pattern of observations to see if human beings can use science to actually triangulate on the truth. That is the science of nutrition. And I have the opportunity to be talking to um, uh, one of the greatest in history, Colin Campbell, about two weeks ago. So we sat down and we chatted the afternoon away and we talked about things like that and many other things that were interesting. And I praised him on his extraordinary new book called you know, the, the Future of Nutrition. Uh, and so, but that is where the question will be answered. And so Colin and people like Colin and John and Dean Ornish and SC and another thousand important people have actually looked at this question very carefully. And there is no evidence to suggest that a raw food diet is, is superior in any particular way. It turns out that raw food, food diets would have been impossible in human evolution uh, uh, in the sense that, that they are too low in cal caloric density and very quickly in the modern environment lead to large percentages of women becoming infertile, okay? So we know even a small change in fertility rates would have doomed the species. 
Okay, so there's no possible way that that could be the way this ever went happen. So now it's an open question as to, for example, whether a 100% raw diet is somehow the magic, fantastic diet that is better than any other, other diet. Is there any theoretical reason to think so? Oh, I don't know. Maybe you could say, well, gee, is, did, did people make a bad trade-off when they started cooking the food? And, and But because they got access to more calories, they were more likely to survive. But if we don't have to do that, we go back to a more raw food diet and it has more phytochemicals and therefore potentially, and we stay out of animal foods because those two don't need to be. Is it possible that the raw food diet is actually better than some other but an omnivore, well, that isn't such an absurd hypothesis, folks. It's an absurd argue it theoretically from an evolutionary standpoint. That is ignorance. That makes no sense at all. Okay. But is it theoretically possible that it's, it is the healthiest diet available to humans right now? Oh, yes, that's theoretically possible. How would you ever know? You have to subject, subject it to scientific experimentation and analysis. Okay. And what do, we, what do we find? Well, the women may get really skinny and they may stop their ability to reproduce, but they don't die. Okay. So what's your, what's, what question is on the table then? So the question isn't what diet leads to maximum reproductive success. The question is what leads us to optimum longevity and the minimal, minima, uh, minimizing disease. It might be to eat a diet so lean that it shuts down menses for all kinds of people but it turns out that they're very skinny and that they live longer and they have less dis you know, disease processes. Maybe, hey, it's an open question. Okay, now, the, uh, the truth of the matter is, I think such a diet is uh, such an odd variance with human natural history of its last million years. Um, I think that, that it's certainly tolerable. Okay, absolutely, there's no question about that. You can go back a million years in time and start re-eating a raw diet. And it turns out that you've still got the machinery for it. Of course we do. Everybody that op opens up an apple and a peach and eats it knows that of course I can use this food, okay? But the question is, is it optimal? Well, that's an interesting question. And my, and my belief is, hmm, I'll bet you we start winding up with interesting problems. So we're gonna have Sarah from you know, Newfoundland that has some quirky little problem as a result of either genetics or she took you know, some kind of drug 13 years ago when she had massive headaches and then that wiped out something in her microbiome and then something else happened and she's got some physical problem. And if she eats a McDougal diet, she doesn't do well, but if she eats a Rothu diet, she does great. You, are you thinking that I'm not gonna believe that? I would totally believe that that is possible, right? So what I'm getting at is this starts to get individual. So don't, don't get into a pissing match over trying to think that you have a diet that you can prescribe for all of humanity and be sure you're right for every single human being. That doesn't make any sense to me at all, okay? So now we start saying, okay, well, what's the best guess? And now we have to start looking at mainstream science and find out what mainstream science says. And mainstream science says that, hey, the kind of diet that McDougall and Campbell and Esselstyn and Ornish are talking about and Furman and Goldhammer, that all looks really good. And the subtle differences between what e any of those guys personally eats or would suggest you eat looks like it's pretty subtle, hard to know. Okay, so, so now we look at a raw food diet, which is fairly significantly different from these guys, but not super different, okay? but it is significantly different. And you say, well, do we think it's better? Hey, prove it to me. Give me a random assignment to control. You know, let's take a look at this. Do you actually have any evidence to suggest it's true? And my, my, my belief is, gee, I don't know, you got a problem. You know, you, uh, I already know you got a problem. We got some problems that come up. You know, how often do they come up? Well, I don't know how often. How often do problems come up with an Esselstyn diet? So, what I'm getting at is that these, this is probably a perfectly viable, reasonable thing that you can do in the modern environment because you can get access to 2,500 calories a day of raw foods in a way that you could not have all over the globe throughout human natural history. That would have been impossible, okay? Can you do it? Yes. Is it optimal? I don't know. You're, you're, you're gonna have to show me some pretty compelling evidence 
to show me that you can beat um, uh, the, the conventional uh, uh, standard diet that I would look at out of a McDougal Ornish Campbell Esselstyn. Pretty tough. Uh, I, I don't know that, and that's what we use at True North. We just use a strict version of it, but that's what it is. Alan Goldhammer's never advocated a raw food diet. Okay. He does not see any reason when he has actually used that at times before. Uh, you can bring him on your show, but he'll tell you, you know what? I'll see people with, you know, once in a while, you'll see some fungal infections. You're looking at a high sugar, high fat diet. Uh, that's what John McDougall is criticizing. He's saying, look, that's an awful lot of sugar. You know, I'm not so sure that's ideal. Okay. Now you might say, well, you might say that, but I've got a nice random assignment to condition trial here. And I've got 500 people that I've had on that diet for two years. And they look better than the 500 people on the McDougal diet for the last two years. So what do you say about that? Well, when you show that to me, we'll have an interesting discussion. Okay. When you show that to me, uh, all we have now is we've got, we've got a triangulation of evidence that has come around from thousands and thousands of nutrition studies that it aims. It does not actually, um, it doesn't indict animal food, but it makes, puts it under a lot of suspicion as Colin Campbell will say, all the regression lines indicate that the best place for the regression line to go through for animal food to minimize your disease is zero. Okay. But we would also recognize that at very low levels of animal food, probably going to be pretty hard to find a difference between a 5% or 10% animal food diet and, uh, if the other 90% is healthy food uh, versus a 100%. Pretty tough. But what we can say is it looks like when you start getting animal food to 20, 30, 40% of calories, if we start statistically and reliably showing an increase in disease processes, okay? But can you show me that a raw food diet is superior to the cooked food diet that our ancestors have been eating for a hundred, you know, a million years? Nope, I don't think you have any evidence for that at all. And there's no reason for me to suspect that it's there. So that is the... The long answer to this question, it's, I hope, I hope that I have treated this with respect. Uh, I, I'm, we're going to say that the argument cannot be solved theoretically because actually nobody's thinking here is actually informed about the entire uh, cinema scope of the problems of human evolution and its diet. If people are interested, probably one of the most informative books that they can, uh, that they can look at is going to be called Catching Fire by Richard Wrangham. Uh, and I think he takes us through a great deal of, of data and theory in that. And it's going to be one of the most informed things you're ever going to read on this topic. Uh, but there's more. There's, uh, there's cultural anthropology. There's all, kinds of, there's all kinds of people we can talk to that are studying little bits of this question. It's really not that important. It's clear. Omnivore, cooked food. Also, there's another thing. There's, there's a comment that, that, that John made. I'm not meaning to criticize this comment at all. I want to point something out. Uh, there's an open question in, in nutrition right now. And Colin actually raises this question briefly somewhere in the future of nutrition. And it's a very important question. Um, and yet, you know, so let me just raise what it is. We don't know how destructive animal food is. And the reason why we don't know how destructive it is in other words, we can point to correlations which indicate that it's a pretty serious problem. But those could be to some degree misleading. And the reason is the very same peoples and cultures that are eating large amounts of animal food, the rest of their vegetable food is terrible. It's French fries and Twinkies, okay? And chocolate cake and, and, and chocolate shakes. It's crap. It's very possible that the evolved human that, uh, that started incorporating animal food at some point, probably 2 million years ago, the, um, that creature also is eating a whole natural foods vegetable diet. And if you were to eat 90% of your calories from whole natural vegetarian sources and you are organically grown, and you were to match that up with 10% of your calories from wild game. I don't believe there's any reason to think that, the, that the, pro the process of digesting and assimilating the wild game is harmful to your health. 
Uh, my guess is that it's not. My guess is that the antioxidants in the vegetable food neutralize the problems associated with animal food metabolism. And that could be true very well all the way up to high percentages of animal food in the diet. It could be that you could eat 30% of your calories from animal food, which I suspect is pretty consistent with human natural history in most places, and 70% of whole natural organically grown plant food, cooked and raw. If you put those two things together, my guess is that's a very healthy diet for humans. Is it as healthy a diet as a vegan diet? Maybe not, but the difference might be so small that it would be absolutely undetectable in evolution. In other words, you might have a few people somehow because of bizarre biologies dying of heart attacks and strokes at 82, but who the hell is gonna to get to 82 in the stone age? Nobody. So the truth is I have a feeling that the animal food is not as bad as we have been thinking because the animal food has been doing its damage and not being mitigated by healthy plant food when we study this question in US and Western populations. Colin is well aware that that is an open question that he doesn't know the answer to. And the reason I bring this up is to bring to people a sense of humility about what we know and what we don't know. We don't even know that animal food is bad for you. We just know that animal food in its present form eaten in the context that it's eaten now is bad for you, okay? So that's why this is a, there are still open questions in nutrition, uh, but we believe, thank goodness, the behind people like Campbell and McDougall and Esselstyn and Ornish and Barnard, people like that have done research to show us at least that we think we are pretty close to optimum. If it turns out there's another trick on the, on the table uh, for an all raw diet, hey, show us, okay? Um, I think I would give this to the raw fooders. I think we're probably better off eating more raw food than the average healthy vegan eats, okay? I think, uh, it, I think that uh, my diet would probably be approved if I was more fastidious about eating more raw food. The, um, uh, Alan eats more raw food than I do. He always seems like he looks a little healthier and more energetic and arm rear, okay? So the point is, is that do I think that we should be listening to and paying attention to the message of more raw food is probably better. I think we should, okay? Do I think that it is a, is a next generation improvement over the McDougal vegan diet? No. Do I think that the McDougal uh, vegan diet is an improvement over the diet of our natural history that included significant amounts of animal food? I don't know. I don't know because we don't have evidence of pristine wild game juxtaposed to huge amounts of unprocessed organically grown plant food eaten together in the same diet over a lifetime. That research doesn't exist, okay? I do know that the McDougal vegan oriented diet is vastly superior to the conventional diet. That I do know, okay? And so uh, what we know and what we don't know, you know, where we stand right now is we know we're on the right track. We know we have nothing, no reason to fear or boo-hoo or be disturbed about cooked food at all. It's a long a part of it, essential part of human natural history. Uh, now, and I think you're, you're probably right, uh, Doug Graham is probably right that we'd be better off with more raw. So I would go ahead and encourage that if you wanna take your diet to the next level. But that's where, that's where it ends. That's where the knowledge ends. And anything else past that point is speculative and cannot be solved by a theoretical approach. It could only be solved by a painstaking, multidimensional, long-term set of investigations. That, you know, and you know, with the vegan diet and cart disease, it began, I think, with Dean Ornish. Okay, so somebody had to do it first, and then we wrap ourselves around that, and then we look at Colin's epidemiological work indicating worldwide evidence with diet and cancer on, on animal food. That's a very interesting piece. Piece by piece by piece, we can arrive at new information. Right now, I believe uh, the McDougal style, McDougal, Campbell, Ornish, Esselstyn concept uh, reigns supreme scientifically at this moment in time. Well, so that's how you feel. 
That That's was amazing. Cool. That was, this is why we have to have questions in advance. You know, you spent the whole hour on that one question. And, and I mean, I appreciate it because you really did unpack it. You know, because when I, I, I don't know if it's because I'm gullible or I see both sides, but when Dr. Graham talks uh, the way he talks, I'm inspired. And when Dr. McDougall talks, I'm inspired. Because one of the things that Dr. Graham said that I thought was interesting is that if, if somebody dropped us off, like just in a wheat field, we yeah. wouldn't survive. Right. You know, and, and, and he also said, and I have trouble with this concept because addiction is something I'm very interested in, that the reason we like cooked food is because it's addictive. And I'm thinking, I don't see anybody going to Arugula Anonymous, you know, maybe maybe processed cooked food like, you know, cakes and stuff are. So I don't know. I just find it so interesting, this this discussion. Oh, uh, yeah. Cook, cooked foods are not addictive. And uh, and you, th th that, that's ridiculous. It isn't the cooking that does it. OK, yeah, that, that is it, the cooking is not is not the story. So that's a completely different issue. So that's confusing uh, variables there. Yeah, people have been cooking foods for a million years and, uh, and not suffering from an addictive process behind that. So that's a misunderstanding. Right. All good. TS says, I absolutely love how Dr. Lyle is able to show how science and evolution work. He's able to explain things in layman's terms. Well, I'm guessing you probably don't have time for more questions. So maybe you'll come back because we don't have you on the schedule for till seven weeks from today. So we got a lot of interesting questions. We'd love to have you answer at another time if you're available. All good. You know, I'm there. I, we love you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lyle. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have another fabulous doctor who was mentioned today, none other than Dr. John McDougall, who will be discussing fish, fat, and oil. Thanks again, Dr. Lyle.